So cool. we're good to go. We're live now. Great. All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Google Plus Hangout with photographer Andy Biggs. This is part of x Rite's Summer Full of Color, and it's a celebration of everything photography during the summer. And one of the great things about being a photographer in the summer months is travel. So that's why I uh, brought on Andy Biggs to talk with us today, because I, I don't know of anyone else that travels as much as you do. So uh, <laughs> to get started, let's go into it. Tell me uh, where you're just returning from. Yeah, um, other than a little family vacation, uh, this year I've spent, God, I've spent a ton of time in Africa. I've been in Kenya, I've been in uh, Tanzania, I've been in Namibia, and I've also been in Florida on the beaches. So <laughs> oh, <not that's> sure. <laughs> <laughs> it counts, it counts. So if you're uh, joining us here today, the, the question and answer section is open. So if you guys want to answer, ask some questions for either me or Andy while we talk, we'll definitely answer them as we go along. So. Andy, again, thank you for, uh, for joining us for this. This is a, a fun way to get to know photographers. And just to start out, before we like, move into the, you know, the gear and the, that, that sort of talk for photography, I like to know, I like to ask photographers sort of like how they came into it. So for you, I know you have a pretty interesting story about how you ended up where you are now. So if you can just give us like a little background about how you got to be someone who does these, takes beautiful photos in amazing parts of the world. Yeah, I have an interesting story in that I really only picked up a camera in 2000. I had never owned a camera before in my life. And I was living out in Silicon Valley. I was in the software world. And, uh, and I picked up a camera because we went camping every weekend in beautiful places. And next thing you know, my time in Silicon Valley was up. And we decided to, to move back to Austin, back to Texas. And we said, hey, let's go put all our stuff in storage and take off and go on a long extended safari in Africa. And that was a six-week trip. And during that six weeks, fell in love with Africa, had a camera in my hand, and next thing you know, I had a business plan wow. to run, run photographic trips in Africa. And then a couple years later, I was doing it full-time. Wow. So it's almost simultaneous. You know, like sometimes I like to ask photographers, like we had a, a hangout with uh, Chris Orwig earlier, and I asked him, you know, which came first, surfing or photography for you? But so for you, it was almost like it, everything just sort of came together on one trip, it sounds like. Well, you know, I would say my love of nature has been there since I was a kid going okay. to camp, but, uh, but it was really photography and Africa kind of ended up in the same world in a short period of time, in, in this very condensed uh, time, and during that six-week safari, I put together that business plan and just executed it, and then coming from a business background, that helps, you know, because I created a plan, and then I, um, I, played, I planned the work, and I worked the plan, so to speak and just basically executed it and made it go through. I, I'm very fortunate that I made that decision before the whole photographic tourism industry really took off. Mm -hmm. And so I was out, I was lucky enough to get out there, get my, my, my name in the industry as kind of the African expert guy. And now there are a lot of people competing, which is fine, there's plenty, there's plenty to go around. But um, I kind of submitted myself in that as, as a specialist. And I'm really glad that I did that as opposed to kind of spending a little bit of time here, a little bit of time there. You know, I, I spend most of my time in Africa. Wow, that's great. Yeah. So on that topic, I, I got to ask you about a specific location that I, <laughs> I've always wanted to go to. In Namibia, you've been to, let's see if I can pronounce this correctly, Komenskop, the, uh, oh, the yeah. abandoned yeah. mining town and like the skeleton coast. Uh -huh. I've, I've always, and I, I love your images from there. So if you can just tell me like a little bit about what it's like to actually be there because it is yeah. really an interesting Location. It's unique. It's very yeah. unique. Let me give, let me give people a little bit of background. Yes, um, please do. Coleman's Cup is a is a is a deserted mining town that was deserted about 60 years ago, but it was established in 1908, and uh, really it was there because of windswept diamonds. And if you look at the geology and the geomorphology of, of Namibia, the Benguela current comes up from the Cape, and it and it forces a lot of sand and deposits onto the beach. And Coleman'scop was put there because there were windswept diamonds on the beach in the sand, and uh, its heyday was the teens. And then when uh, Germany lost World War One, it, it kind of a lot of things started to unwind. But th these homes were wealthy people's homes, and were able to to gain access to this area and take photographs of it in a way that's. It's really uh, it's beautiful in a in a de decaying way, if mm -hmm. that makes any sense. You know, you're photographing cracked paint, right? <laughs> and um, but it is it's a beautiful place. It can be really cold, really windy, and it can be really really hot. I've 
I've been photographing there most every year for the la for the past ten years. Wow! And it's a pretty cool place. I've got enough images to probably pull off a book if I wanted to, but that's a function of time. <laughs> oh yeah, of course. Well, I. I'd be interested to see it. That's definitely. I, I shoot a lot of cracked paint, as you said. So that's uh, <laughs> that's definitely when I was going through. I was like, oh, I gotta ask him about that place. I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, you know, photographically speaking, it's it's uh, you're trying to combine a lot of different disciplines. You're you're trying to um, take uh, take an eye, kind of like an architectural photographer. So you're trying to line up all your lines vertically, nice. But you're also photographing reflected light that's coming in. You're having to look for different colors, contrasting colors, and you have to put your creative hat on and not think of yourself as like some sort of architectural digest kind of photographer. Everything has to be perfect. And it's a, it's a fun, fun, fun place. And it stretches people their first day there. They look around and they're like, this seems so simple, but it's so difficult. Um, yeah. So. Well, that sounds yeah, that sounds amazing. <laughs> and since we we kind of we dipped into shooting a little bit, I always like to ask photographers about you know their gear and what they bring with them. But before we get into that, you yeah. recently wrote in an article uh, on your blog, which is the theglobalphotographer.com, right, about switching to to medium format digital, which I I loved the read. So if you could just tell <laughs> us a little bit. Again, a little bit of jealousy there, taking there. <laughs> so if you could well, just tell us a little bit about that, that change for you, right? Because it is a very different way to work. Well, it is for a wildlife photographer, that's for sure. Yeah, of um, course. Yeah, so l let me kind of take a few steps back and talk sure. about my approach to photography and how this is all supported. So most people, I think, when they go out in the field, they're thinking of um, what subjects they like to shoot. Or maybe they go out and shoot a landscape and they kind of put up their tripod and they kind of wait for the light to change. You know, that's great, but I kind of take a different approach. I, I, I like to, to come up with a list of adjectives to shoot. So for me, it's remote, timeless, hopeful, uplifting, regal, and I create this long list, and I've been shooting this way for the better part of 12, 13 years now. And I shoot whatever supports those adjectives, whether it's black and white or color, whatever the subject is, whatever the lighting conditions are. And um, I shoot that way. Well, then, by the way, this is going to be in the September issue of Outdoor Photographer as well. Oh, great. Um, so it's, 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 it's kind of an interesting approach. It's different, but it's a long-term approach. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it enables me to string together a list of, of photographs or a portfolio taken over many, many years that are all tied together. That's, that's the benefit. That's really so, interesting. Yeah, so for me, those adjectives, let's go through mine again, my basic ones. So timeless, remote, hopeful uplifting. Well, a lot of that isn't your typical wildlife photography kind of list list because a lot of people like to photograph action, they like to photograph uh, predation and that's not me. Well, that's good because switching to medium format doesn't work that way. <laughs> so, medium format for anybody who's not aware, it's a larger sensor or uh, uh S the system has much larger, bulkier lenses that are not as fast. Autofocus is slower. My frames per second is not 7, 8, 10, 11, 12 frames a second. It's 1. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm limited to an ISO range with the back that I currently have of 35, 50, 100, 200, maybe 400 if I'm lucky. And so it's very limiting, but it's okay because my style of photography lends itself to that. Um, I'm typically looking for more animals in the landscape types of shots as opposed to always filling the frame. And I do that as well. But I, I love the storytelling abilities of putting wildlife in their environment and having a large capture device like 60 or 80 megapixels. These large files allow me to basically make big prints and still have enough detail on the subject where it, it makes sense. Yeah. No. What I find really interesting yeah. about that is you you seem to you tailor your equipment to the way you like to shoot, but then you also have stuff built in that exercises your muscles. You know, like I think that's an important. <laughs> there's an important. Well, like you know, physically, I'm sure because the gear is pretty heavy, but also your your photographic muscles because I think a lot of photographers can sort of fall into a trap of just shooting like not challenging yourselves, and that's what I think is really interesting about the adjectives thing is that you're always like sort of like while it links back, you're always sort of keeping yourself sharp by challenging yourself and tailoring at the same time. And I think that's a really important lesson for people to learn. Yeah, there, there's a little more to the story, though, because um, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm a very patient person. 
I'm extremely patient. Meaning, I mean, I'm out in the bush 15, 16, 18 weeks out of the year. That's a lot. That's a third of the year. That's four months. Wow. And in those four months, I see a lot of things. I see a lot of things that are worthy of photographs. But I've also seen those things many times in the last 13, 14 years doing what I'm doing for a living. And so I'm very patient. But also, like when I'm in Kenya, I drive my own vehicle. I don't have room for a large bag sitting next to me. Um, I can take one camera and put it in my lap while I'm driving, and that's what I have. And I, I just need that one camera to make, um, <laughs> to make the most sense. And uh, like the longest lens that I have on my Phase One kit is a Schneider 240 millimeter lens, which in the in the, in the Nikon and Canon. Uh, 35 millimeter world, it's equivalent to about 150 millimeters. That's my longest lens. So, <laughs> yeah, I have a teleconverter, but I don't use it. I really wow. don't use it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it, is it limiting? Not for some. Um, if you were to go to one location one time and that's all you ever have to do and you got to make sure that you get all the photographs, maybe this is kind of, maybe not your, <laughs> your, <laughs> your best kit to, to adopt. But for me, I often shoot with two different kits at the same time. So I might have a Nikon body and a lens or two plus the phase one camera if it's on a wildlife trip. And if it's a landscape trip, I only shoot medium format because that, wow. that makes the most sense. Yeah, well, you actually you, you tied into a little bit my next question there, which was going to be packing. Like, what tool, <laughs> like, do you have some tips? Because even with me, I mean, I, I, just going on a vacation, right, as a photographer, you start looking at all your gear and you're like, oh, I, you know, it's... It's challenging to like what you want to bring with you. Sometimes you bring way too heavy stuff and you don't end up using it. And but the other side of it is getting somewhere and being like, oh, I really wish I had my 70 to 200. So as someone that like you know you do this a lot, do you have any tips for the people you know watching this about packing a proper kit, like thinking ahead, that sort of stuff? Yeah. Well, the, before I give you that answer, I'm going to okay. give you a different a different answer, um, which is you know there's an adage. And the adage says that self, uh, self constraints breed creativity. What that means is that pick a camera and a lens or two, put it in your bag and go shoot. And it, they're not maybe they're not always the most appropriate for what you think you need to shoot, but you're going to get creative with what you have. Hmm. And so um, that's the way I approach photography. You know what? I'm not going to get every shot. That's okay because I value the experience, the moment, just as much as the photograph. Um, I'm also in the business of leading photographic trips for other photographers. So it's not actually my job to take photographs. If I get an opportunity mm -hmm. to take a shot, that's great, but it's not my job. It's not my job. So um, with that being said, <laughs> I'll answer the question. <laughs> no, so, that was a very I, – yeah. <laughs> I like your philosophy on this. It's very – it's a little refreshing, yeah. Yeah, it's, but um, I don't like to carry a lot of gear. I used to. I used to, and my 45-year-old body is getting tired of schlepping around 40-pound camera bags. Um, I will typically um, boil down a kit to bare minimum uh, just to make, to make sense. So I tell people, you know, try not to bring overlapping or redundant types of lenses. Like if you don't shoot macro and you already have a 70 to 200, why bring the macro when you can take a 70 to 200 and that Canon 250D or the 500D diopter you put on the front. It's like a poor man's macro. Mm -hmm. Works great. You know, don't don't overburden yourself with things that don't really make that much sense. Just because you own it is not justification that you have to use it. That's a that's a very good adage actually. I think you just added one there. <laughs> yeah, just, just because you own it. I mean, I know I have a lot of customers that own a lot of gear. Yeah. And that's great. But do you really want to take it all on a trip? Really? I mean, like, for example, I leave to go to East Africa in three weeks. I'm going to go photograph chimpanzees in Uganda. I'm going to go photograph mountain gorillas in Rwanda. Then I'm going to go over to Kenya and photograph the wildebeest migration. So that's three different locations. The first part of the trip, um, so let me first state that I sold off all of my Nikon and Canon gear. It's all gone. I don't wow. own a single 35 millimeter product anymore. So what I do is I, I have all this phase one gear. And then on a trip-by-trip -trip basis, I'll rent from borrowlenses.com whatever makes sense for that trip. So for this trip, uh, I just put my order in today for a 5D Mark III, a 70 to 200 f2.8 to photograph primates. And then when I get to the Mara, I'll use that, and then I'll use 
my phase one kit. So I'm basically bringing two cameras, two lenses, and a 1.4 teleconverter for the 7 into 200. Wow. That's, that's it. I'm not going to have a huge lens. That's okay. That's fine. You know, um, it's not, you know, it's not needed. You don't really need it. You have to think about yourself as a photographer. We're visual storytellers, and I like right. to make the assumption that, that um, our photographs don't have a narrative to go with it. When people see a photograph, they don't have a paragraph or two to describe what's going on. They have to only use the visual cues. And I figure that the more I step back and the more I include, as long as it's kind of clean and makes sense, the easier it is for them to actually figure out what that story is. Interesting. That's a, yeah. I, yeah, that's a cool, that's a very good way of looking at it, I think, yeah. actually. But it also lends itself really well to making big prints, like this, this guy right back here. Oh, yeah, here. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's a 40 by 60 inch canvas. Um, so 40 by 60, it looks pretty small <laughs> here, <laughs> but it's a, pretty, it's a pretty monumental piece, and I like to be able to make big prints. With impact, yeah? Yeah, and that was shot with at about 100, 100 millimeters on a D3 camera with a 70 to 200 with a line up in the tree a couple years ago. So it doesn't always require big, huge lenses. You know, it's not, I'm not saying I won't use them, because yeah, maybe in a few months I'll rent a 600 and go get something different. But for now, this is kind of my approach. <laughs> hey, no, I, I really, that's, that's what I love to hear. Everyone's a little bit different, and I think yours is, is really interesting in a way that I'm just, I mean, I'm not interrupting because I'm, I'm loving hearing about it, I think. <laughs> but so you, you touched on, on post-processing, and I, I do, I want to get into that in a little bit. But first, um, well, just from me, um, I'm the son of a marine biologist and an ecologist, and you're, you know, you said your love of nature, and you're out there a lot. So before we move on to, like, more photographic stuff, I think it'd be remiss if I, I didn't bring up the conservation aspect of what you do. And so, like, if there's some, you know, I would love if there was just certain issues or something like that that you'd want to you'd point people to to be aware of because you're, you're definitely out there in the field with yeah. these animals. So, yeah, so let me first say that, like, there's, there's an interesting balance between being in the tourism industry and conservation. Right. Because some people in the research world kind of believe – kind of look at the tourism industry as uh, a little bit of a necessary evil, like we're somehow, uh, our resource management is uh, opposite of what is needed for conservation. I disagree with that personally, if it's done right. Um, but uh, right now, I, I basically see three different animals as, as being my focus for conservation in Africa. Okay. That would be the African elephant, the Loxodonta africana. That would be the rhinos and also the lions. And if you look at those three, these are basically apex subjects for photographers. And if they go away, my business goes away. <laughs> so, <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I, have a, I have a vested interest to make sure that they're uh, taken care of. And uh, it's been a difficult decision trying to figure out what, what um, organizations to back and who to, to work with. But uh, so there's the, the biggest umbrella is going to be the World Wildlife Foundation, mm -hmm. WWF, and then there's an African Wildlife Foundation uh, that's very specific to Africa. And then another one that I like to support is the Big Life Foundation, which is the uh, photographer Nick Brandt. He co-started that in East Africa and Kenya um, in the Amboseli region for the benefit primarily of elephants. So, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. For yeah. that. Like I said, that's a... Uh... Oh, I was going to use the phrase elephant in the room, but <laughs> maybe That's a bit I'll, ironic. Yeah, yeah I'll, 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 I'll just step away from that one. <laughs> so, uh, like I said, I want to I want to talk about post processing because you you obviously have some amazing prints behind you. And before we go into your philosophy on that side, like we did of the shooting, I just always like to ask photographers, like you know, we ask what's in your gear bag, but I think a lot of times people don't ask like what's in your post processing bag. So I just Ooh, you know what, you know what plugins do you have around what equipment do you do you you know like to use sort of stuff like that if you wouldn't mind going into that a bit yeah I'll nerd out a little bit so oh, yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm a Lightroom guy first of all okay uh, for a lot of my photographs but I also use Capture One from Phase One for mm -hmm. my Phase One files and um, I use Photoshop so I'm a subscriber to the um, the Adobe Creative Cloud, the $10 a month plan, which gives me 
Photoshop CC 2014 and Lightroom, as well as Lightroom on the iPad oh, and okay. the iPhone. And um, then I use Nick's plugins. And Hi, Google. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, but I have a very, very kind of specific workflow that I use. I use and take advantage of all the smart objects in Photoshop. And I have a very kind of specific thing that I do that I teach people when they come to my studio that enables them to always be able to go backwards and forwards and make changes as they want without having to worry about destructive edits. Oh, That's man. a big deal. It's a big it deal is. these days. Yeah, because I can't tell you how many times I look back at some of these files that I processed in you know, 2007, 2006, and I didn't have access to the smart objects or these plugins, and it's, I ha almost have to start over all over again. Yeah, exactly. I've, I've been in that same boat myself a few times. Yeah, it's a pain. Yeah. <laughs> it's a massive pain, yeah. And so I, run, I do these um, three-day intensive, uh, what I call post-processing and printing workshops for two to three people in here for three days. You know, that's all we do. We process images, we print them, we do it more, and we do it again, and we do it again. We, at, by the end of the third day, we're printing really big things like that. Oh, yeah. I and, like that. Uh, yeah, and then people go home with a big tube. I ship them to, to their house when they get back home. And they have prints to go home with. They know how to print their own on their own printers. And it's a lot of fun. And the whole workflow is basically ironed out. So, I, so I, we'll go a little bit more nerdy, if you don't mind, because I, I worked oh, in the post production. Let's go nerd. We can go yeah, nerdy. I, I worked in the post production <laughs> realm of the industry for about ten years before I started working for X Right. And so you have really big files coming out of the phase one, right? I mean, like, <laughs> yeah. What are we talking? You know, the average, the average raw file, which is a fourteen bit file, uh, the average file that's coming out of my eighty megapixel back is somewhere hundred to one hundred and twenty meg. <laughs> So, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, what is your file archiving process like? Oh, what do you man, use? I, wish, I wish I could move my video camera around the studio, but um, <laughs> I, I use Synology boxes. Oh. And I have, um, this is really nerdy stuff. I apologize. Oh, Anybody who's listening to this, this is really nerdy. Nerd. <laughs> <laughs> so, I use uh, three different Synology boxes one's a five bay, and two of them are eight bay boxes. I've got one at home and two at the office. And I've got uh, Comcast business class service for the internet. And I actually have them syncing through the web to each other and archiving in a round robin configuration. One backs up to one, one backs up to another, and one backs up to another. Wow. So they're always going in a circle. And it also helps me synchronize like movies and MP3 files between home and office. It does a lot of stuff for me. But it, it, it solves versioning and it solves off-site backups. And I also recently subscribed um, to business apps, uh, Google Apps for Business, okay. for my, for my um, email provider. And then also I upgraded to the unlimited space on Google Drive. Oh, wow, you're on unlimited, huh? I was I'm an unlimited dork, yeah. Like, wow. <laughs> yeah, what's funny is I saw the, I saw the, uh, I saw the amount and it said 10 terabytes. If you want more, just ask. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will probably hit six to eight terabytes within a month or two. Wow. It, it takes a while to up. up yeah, yeah, the upstream on that must be quite tough, but that's... Yes. It's crazy, but I was using CrashPlan before, and it just was too slow and too cl kludgy. And so um, I'm pretty happy with this with this plan. That's great. And I take and I also have a, an 800 pound safe here in the office, and I have some kind of offline Thunderbolt single drives that I just take out and put in there from time to time. Cool. Refresh them every month or two. Yeah, I used to do something. I do something similar, and I mean not on the same scale, because I mean I'm shooting a D700, so my file sizes are a little bit smaller than yours. But I think that oh, yeah. <laughs> I think that part of the of the photography it's it's glazed over a lot by photographers. You know, like we don't because it's boring. We don't talk about it, but it is sort of this like back end to what we all do. That's it's maybe it's scary to think about sometimes, but backing up is such a <laughs> An yeah, important but, you know, thing to get into. You know what, though, you have to think about it from a business standpoint. If you're if you're a, a photographer who's earning a living in photography, I look at my photographic archive as an annuity mm -hmm. that represents future value for me that I have to protect, and it costs money, and it takes time, and it I have to worry about it. But so what? That's fine. But about once a year, I'll have a little archiving party uh, on a weekend. I sit around, you know, drink some good wine, and just sit there and go delete. Delete, delete, <laughs> delete, delete, 
And you know, I'll I'll carve out a good fifty to hundred gigs in a in a day just getting rid of stuff I'll never ever use. Yeah. Yeah, I think, oh God, man, that photograph from two thousand and four shot with a Canon sixty or D sixty that's <laughs> out, of, out of focus. Like, why do I need that? Yeah, no, yeah, I have to do that sometimes too. It's that photographer feel like, but well, what? Maybe it'll come in handy sometimes, nah. and then it just like gets to the back of your files, and they just like hang back out there, and you're like, what was that? Yeah, that's a. I think I need to have an archiving party myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's kind of fun, you know. It's like having a wine or a vinegar party. You have a bunch of old wine. You invite friends over, and you ask the question: Is it wine or is it vinegar? I like that. Just, just just drink, you know. <laughs> well, I do I do my own little pity party, and I sit there and I click delete, you know. It's all good. <laughs> so yeah, we are in the nerdy realm of it. So before we get more flay, we have to bring up color management, of course, which is yeah. another sort of similar thing to to backing up, right? It's it's sort of a Part of what we do, but it kind of it. I, you know, even though I work there, I know it doesn't come up as as much as it should for some photographers. So and then that surprises me, which it actually makes me really sad because I'll have people come in here to the studio. And we'll say, okay, we've got three days of processing and printing, and then I'll look at each person and say, so what are you using to calibrate your display in your environment? And that big question mark shows up on their forehead, and I'm like, uh oh, mm. we need to have it. We need to have a talk. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so usually on the first couple of hours of the of the these three days, is I go over color management, why it's important, color consistency, and you don't have to stab in the dark. And it's the cheapest of all the things you own. It's the cheapest that has the most value. Right. We're talking like I, I use an X Rite i1 display pro and you know for 200 and something dollars you're done yeah you're done you're done that's cheaper than any lens you can buy exactly and you're going to spend <laughs> more time in front of a sometimes you spend more time in front of a monitor than you do in back of a lens unfortunately it blows me away it just blows me away so i'm i'm out there basically tooting the horn saying you guys have to do this you have to <laughs> thanks for that <laughs> yeah yeah banging you on the head a little bit you know but it's um yeah it's necessary definitely necessary Right. So yeah, now now let's go a little bit back. You know, you were talking about your your workflow and your philosophy when you're shooting. So it's interesting to frame this question. But when you're working on a file, you know, like some there's like a lot of different views on how people do it. You know, like some people say you have to kind of do as little as possible. Some people say there's just like a sort of a way to follow the image. So when you get that image, and it is also <laughs> a little bit different for you, right? Because what comes out of the phase one is pretty. It's it's uncompressed, like it's pretty raw. What comes out of the phase one, like people that haven't shot with a medium format back, don't realize that it's even when you're shooting with a 35 millimeter DSLR. There's some processing that goes on between, you know, your sensor and what the file comes out, even though you don't know it. Camera's well, doing it. Yeah, but I mean, like medium like format, that's even less, right? Well, so I would the, say you know the the most glaring thing on medium format that kind of with a little bit of a learning curve is that their anticipation of what a white balance should be is not as accurate out of the box as what my Nikon or Canon equipment would do. Really? So I've had to learn, you know, just kind of you have to see and you have to get it there. But uh, I'm a guy who likes to process images in less than five minutes. Wow. If it takes more than five minutes, I probably have gone to another image and I didn't do my job in the field properly. That's the kind of way I look okay. at it. And um, I don't have time to screw around for two hours on a photograph. I, I, I wish I did, but I don't. Um, I think most people view people who are in the industry as, oh, you know, if you're not on a trip, you must have a ton of time sitting around and processing your photographs. I wish. I wish. But no, I do. I get in there, and I get it done really quickly. And uh, I try not to spend a lot of time on my photographs. Wow. <laughs> that is pretty quick. <laughs> yeah, I like black and white conversions. Sometimes ninety seconds and I'm done. Wow. Yeah. That's impressive. I'm done. <laughs> well, it's depressing because it's sometimes it's just a function of available time. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair, fair. <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm gonna do a little bit of housekeeping really quick and then we'll finish up. You mean you have some photos that you wanna screen screen share and show us some examples of? Yeah, let me and let so, me kinda throw some stuff in here. While uh, you do that I'll do a little bit of uh, X right housekeeping. Um this is the summer full of color, like I mentioned. So we're running rebates these in for the next uh well, for the next month. And so that device Andy was talking about, the i1 Display Pro, you get a twenty five dollar online rebate on that. 
And like I said, those are running to the end of August, and there's rebates on all of our devices. So that's part of the summer full of color, as is these little hangouts we're doing. And we're going to be doing more, so just keep an eye on this page to see other photographers. And yeah, I'd love to see um, what you got up to show us. Yeah, let me uh, kind of just, I, I think a lot of the images I'm going to show are fairly um, uh, common images that I've, I have around. Sure. Um, let's see here, I'm trying to figure out how to screen share. So when you go, yeah, go over to the side, there should be a, a screen share button that comes up if you go to your left. Yeah, there we go. Let's share that bad boy out. There we go. Beautiful. Yeah, so, you know, when it comes to visual storytelling, you know, I love clouds. I love wildlife. And my philosophy is that the, su the, the shape of a subject basically uh, carries a photograph, especially a black and white image because you don't have color information to, to, to rely on. So we know what a giraffe is. We know what it looks like because we've been taught since we were two years old what a giraffe looks like. It's got a long neck, four legs, some spots, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm usually looking for a, a heavy amount of separation between uh, an, an animal or a subject and its foreground and background. Okay. Usually based upon tonality and shape. You know, is the background darker or lighter? Um, significantly different, hopefully. And um, does the subject kind of stand out? And the answer is yeah, it does. And it lends itself to bigger photographs, that's for sure, um, meaning something 20 inches on the short side and the long side could be 30 or 40 inches. Mm -hmm. um, that's a small image. You can get much, I can get a lot, lot bigger. But I like that kind of visual storytelling, that, that kind of bigger picture, what's going on out there. It's difficult to find in nature because I find nature inherently very messy. I mean, nature has a lot of trees, grasses, and twigs, and Things are just going in different directions and different colors and tones, and it's our job as a photographer to basically clean it up. So we use our shooting position, where we position ourselves, or a tripod or a vehicle, and the focal length to try to exclude things. So I look at it like photography. We're the opposite of painters. Painters include things. They have a, a canvas, and they decide what they're going to put on that canvas. So they're including things. Well, what we're doing out in the, in the field is we're doing the process of exclusion. We're trying to look to the sides and say, what, you know, what doesn't make sense to be in the photograph? And right. Yeah, I like one, that a lot. <laughs> you know, but, but one thing you can do is you can kind of make, play a, like a little bit of a game. You can say, you know, here we have all these different compositional elements, and do those elements either add, subtract, or have no bearing on the overall um, composition of the photograph. So in other words, you attribute a positive, a negative, or a neutral to everything that's on the photograph. And you try to de-accentuate the negatives based upon your focal length or where you're shooting, or the time of day. Maybe it's the wrong light. So you have to get as many of those positives, get rid of the negatives, and the neutrals are just there. Great. That's kind of, kind of a, a little bit of a world according to Andy. No, but, yeah, <laughs> I'm really. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, I mean, it's to me. Oh wow! I just like big open spaces. I like places that take a viewer someplace that is so obviously not, you know, Manhattan or like a big city or somewhere even domestically. Just take you someplace that puts you in a different frame of mind, where you re you recognize that there are wild places on this planet where not many people live or go, where there's abundant wildlife, a lot of beauty, and I like to take people there and just kind of tell a story. Yeah. So here we've got a, a big bull elephant just walking through the Okavango Delta in this very shallow water and having his reflection in the scene a little bit. It kind of takes you someplace. Oh, you know, this, it's not a zoo. It's not a nature preserve that's got fences around it, although it, I guess it could be, but, you know, it's definitely a place that's not uh, not home. And here's a here's a photograph taken from a hot air balloon a few years ago over the Serengeti Plains in, in Tanzania. Um, so to kind of support what we were talking about, this visual storytelling, mm -hmm. um, as a photographer, as a person who's showing images, I'm also selling a concept to to viewers. I'm selling the concept that something is happening and I can 
I don't say it trick you, but I'm selling that this is some sort of morning fog, early rise in the morning, we get up in the hot air balloon or the helicopter, whatever people think that it is that I'm in, and uh, we see this morning dew and this, this fog is, is lifting and the sun is coming through it. And It's actually not true. It, what it is, it's actually the dust that's kicked up from the Land Rover that's chasing the hot air balloon to make sure that when we land, they're going to grab the ropes. Oh, wow. Yeah, but, but again, it's about that storytelling. I'm proposing and I'm pushing a story and I'm pushing in a direction hoping that you'll bite. Okay. Mm -hmm, definitely, I see that. And, and that's really, that's really, you have to think about that. You know, even though I think of myself as a fine art photographer, which that's kind of a loaded term to begin with, um, I still have to have an editorial photographer's brain. Okay. That's very Meaning, important. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm selling a story. I'm selling a story. And um, if you look at my list of photographs, you probably think that the only thing I like are giraffes and elephants, which is probably <laughs> fair. Is probably fair, <laughs> probably fairly true, I guess. But, hey, I mean, everyone's got a favorite something. <laughs> yeah, I mean, those are my two favorite animals. But um, like here, we've got a giraffe, some clouds, and I've got a, an oxpecker jumping off the back. And in wildlife photography, it's really it's really enjoyable to sit and watch and look for these, these, these relationships between subjects. And there's a lot of adjectives that you gain when you watch interacting subjects. So we talked about my adjectives earlier, this timeless, remote, hopeful, uplifting, mm -hmm. regal type of approach to photography. Well, I find that when you start adding more subjects in the frame, whether it's the same species or at other species, I get longer lists of adjectives. Huh. Yeah, and so, so, kind of the way that I sort through my, my 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 library of images is I kind of have this in the back of my mind: how many adjectives am I applying to this image? And if the if I can only come up with half a dozen, and the next image I come up with twelve, uh, probably the one with twelve is going to win me out. Oh, yeah, that's a good. That helps the uh, the editing, the editorial brain, like you said, and probably the archiving party <laughs> too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, big time. Like here, we've got some lions just sitting on a small um, extinct termite mound uh, in the Masai Mara in Kenya. You know, when I print this thing really large, this is shot with my Phase One kit. When I print this really large, there's plenty of detail on the lions. Mm -hmm. You know, this you you know what's going on, but it's it's one of those images that maybe it's not an award winner, but it helps kind of tell the story, what's going on out there, and it helps me in a, in a body of images or a series of images of 15 or 20 or 30 images that helps glue everything together. So um, one person once told me one time, there are seven different types of photographs that, that you should take if you want to kind of capture everything. You should capture an opener. You should at, capture a closer. Mm -hmm. Take photographs of the wide angle with a zoom take some detailed shots, take a portrait, and make sure you capture a special moment. Those are seven different photographs. And then when you shoot all those, when you start assembling, like a, if you were to put the book together in the, the most common photographic cocktail table book, it's about has, has about 130 photographs in it. Wow. Well, yeah. all 130 certainly can't look the same. You kind of need to vary your look and, and your style between verticals, horizontals, zoomed in, wide angle, to kind of vary those looks. So that's, this is one of those images that might just help glue the other images together. So. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you for sharing these. These are wonderful. These are kind of fun. It, it's kind yeah. of fun to talk about the creative side of photography because there's a lot, um, there's a lot of gear talk out there these days, mm -hmm. which is fine. And um, like I, I, I go away to Africa in a couple weeks, three weeks. Right. And I mulled over buying or renting a little Panasonic GH4 and a couple of lenses for all my wildlife, plus my phase one medium format stuff. Oh. And, and I came really close to, to pulling the trigger on it. But ultimately, I, I backed away just for some other reasons. But it's, um, it's liberating when you stop thinking about gear as often and you start thinking about the creative process. I totally because agree. Yeah, creativity should drive what gear you 
use should drive what settings you use as opposed to showing up on a trip and you know the manual to your camera front and back. You know everything about that camera. But you know what, though? That camera doesn't do anything by itself uh, uh, regarding creativity. It does nothing by itself. So just a little... A little no, bit of little philosophy. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm the, you, you were saying, you're basically saying everything I, I'm, I'm hoping to do with these little talks of photographers in, in a nutshell there is that I, I, I want to do these sort of hangouts, you know, so we can talk about the parts that you're not going to read, the parts of photography that you're not going to read on a gear review site and that you may not get, you know, even if you're looking at like a nice gallery mm -hmm. on Nat Geo or something like that. There's still that other side of photography that for whatever reason doesn't really... Uh, bubble to the top a lot when we talk about it. So that's exactly what I, I love yeah. to hear photographers talk about. And what I love to do more of these hangouts is just to hear photographers talk <laughs> about that part. Because I think that part is, it's it's more it's more helpful to other photographers, you know, starting out, but even photographers have been shooting for years. Like that sort of stuff, just bouncing off of each other and hearing that sort of stuff, I know I find very, very useful to my own work, and so I'm hoping other people will too. You know, one thing I, I was, I've was i been thinking about doing lately, and this may kind of, uh, it, it can backfire on me, so I have to watch uh, out, but no. <laughs> I, I actually thought about buying an entry-level Canon SLR. I think there's a three or $400 SLR, and go buy two lenses, a kit 18 to 55, and one of those like 70 to the 300 or 75 to 300 kind of really affordable um, zoom lens, and just use that for a year. That's wow. all I use for wow, a while. A year, yeah. huh? <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's an exercise in constraint, right? But it's also a, an opportunity to try to um, sell that whole concept that gear is going to make less of an impact on your photographs than what's between your ears, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. but that can that can backfire on me. It, it can either make me look like the biggest a hole on the planet, like I've got an ego, which I don't, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, or it could backfire me because my customers might say, "Well, Andy doesn't shoot with gear I shoot with. I mean, he doesn't know what I shoot with. I kind of want to go on a trip where I have a leader that understands." All the yeah. buttons on all the newest equipment, so I have to watch out for that double-edged sword. That is, it's interesting, but I, I like <laughs> I like the the sentiment behind it, though. I do, I, I you know I I recently because I, I travel a bit for X right you know, and I I, could, I couldn't travel with my my DSLR shut up, so I just bought a little the so like a little Sony point and shoot the uh, the RX100, and just had that in my bat. Yep. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so you know, right? Like just having that little. Uh, <laughs> That something in between a camera phone and a DSLR with me has it's it's changed the way I shoot way more than I expected, and I think it's actually helping when I bring out my big camera and stuff like that, and then taking it back a step. It's it's interesting. It's it's a it's a weird thing photographers have, right? Because you know you mentioned painting before. Painters don't have blogs telling them about the new paint that's coming out. You know, and so like we, it's easy to get caught up. It's easy to get caught up in in the gear cycle, yeah. and then forget you know why we were buying them in the first place. So I think it's a really good exercise. You know, like like you were saying before, it's a really good exercise to maybe like let yourself go back and then to go forward again. You know, slow yourself down, even if the medium format, right? Slow yourself yeah. down, speed yourself up. That sort of stuff is sort of what I was getting at. You know, in the beginning when we were talking about exercising your muscles. Your photographic muscles. Yeah, you know, I mean, I went to the Galapagos, um, and and yeah, I was gonna uh, ask about that. Oh, what was that? It was June. It was June. Yeah. So it was a month and a half ago, mm -hmm. and I was there for a week, and I took um, a Phase One camera, one lens from Phase, uh, actually two lenses, and I took this little point and shoot. Mm -hmm. And I had just as many successful photographs with this point and shoot than mm -hmm. I did a big huge camera, and mm -hmm. it's not because the other stuff couldn't work. It's just that sometimes the best camera that you shoot that 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 gets you that creative shot is just the one you've got, mm -hmm. whatever it is, whatever's with you, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just just illustrated. So, like on a lot of trips, or wildlife trips, this is my wide-angle lens now, huh? Because it fits in my my pocket, and I can drive around and no problem. But uh, it kind of replaced my twenty-four to seventy. <laughs> wow. wow. Yeah. So let's see a few more geeky questions. And again, the the Q and A is open. So if anyone watching has questions for the either of us, you can submit them now. But uh, you know, giant print behind you, giant printer behind you. 
<laughs> oh, you see that too, huh? Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I gotta, I gotta ask about paper when you're going to print. Like, what, what do you look for when you're choosing, when you're choosing papers? I'm gonna first show you my big, huge list of a wallow paper there. Wow. Um, yeah, it, it really depends on what the final output is. Uh, for me, a um, a decision that I make is, is that person going to touch the paper first? Are they going to see the paper, or is it, get, am I going to print, deliver it to somebody, like a framer, it gets framed and then puts on, gets put on somebody's wall, and they never see the paper? Well, to me, there's a big decision. So if someone's going to see and touch that paper, I'm very likely going to choose cotton paper, mm -hmm. um, especially if it's in a portfolio box, uh, which I sell, uh, that people often put on uh, cocktail tables. Um, you know, kind of cocktail table, coffee table, excuse me. And um, but if it's going to go behind glass, I might choose something that has a little more punchy color, a little more sharpness to it, and that might end up being um, some sort of like Barita paper, um, luster type paper. Great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, but, I, but I'm a big fan of cotton. Big, big fan yeah. of cotton. I am as well, oh, yeah. actually. Yeah. <laughs> Especially for black and whites. Oh yeah, I yeah. love it. All right. Well, let's see. Uh, well, looks like we got one question to go out on. So you mentioned the the trip you have coming up, but what is the trip that you're you're kind of you're because you've been many many places. Is there a place you've yet to be that you're kind of you're looking for? You're making moves towards somewhere that you're. It's tough, right? Because you've been a lot yeah. of places. But is there somewhere that you're kind of like, that's going to be 2015. I'm planning a trip there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been a lot of places. Um, well, in November, I'm leading a trip um, to back to Antarctica, but I'm going to South Georgia for the first time, which I'm really excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, so I haven't been there. I'll be there in a few months. So that, maybe that doesn't really answer that question. Uh, next year, I've never, uh, I'm have never. i going to India in May for Tigers. haven't been to wow. the Tigers before, so that'll be fun. But it's planned. So what do I have that's unplanned, I guess, is my question. Yeah, what's your, isn't there something that's like, you know, in the back of your head, like, ah. Oh. Yeah, you know, that's a really good question. I have so many that I don't even know where to start. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, but probably Jaguars and the Pantanal is really high on the list. Oh, yeah. I haven't been there. I'd like to see, I need to get more polar bear opportunities in different places. Uh, I've spent my time in, in, in Canada doing that, and I'd like to go other places. Um, I'd probably like to get over to Kamchatka uh, in Russia and do some more brown bear shooting. Mm -hmm. um, God, for wildlife, yeah, for landscapes. Jeez, there's like oh. <laughs> my list is dozens, <laughs> dozens long. You know, it, it's kind of weird as a, as a guy who I, I'm I'm an African specialist. At least that's what I say I am. Mm -hmm. But all these other non-African things keep popping into my brain, and I always say that I'll do one, maybe two non-African trips per year. That's okay. it, because I have so much demand for the African stuff that I don't want to ignore that and push people away, or you know. Not not satisfy the demand, so it's going to take me a while to to, to be able to get everywhere with that approach. <laughs> I think that's a good problem to have, man. I got to tell you. <laughs> yeah, I guess it is. It's good. It's good. I mean, I was looking at my website today, and I thought I don't have any trip through mid next year that's not sold out. Oh. Like I don't. Like they're all booked, and I haven't even had the time to build my web pages for later next year. And there are, I have trips ready. I just don't have time to help build them. Wow. If anybody out there needs <laughs> wants to do some web work, let me know. <laughs> well, because you mentioned it, I want to – you mentioned all those websites, so people watching yeah. this now and later will know. So you have andybiggs.com is the main one, correct? Mm -hmm. And then your yep. blog is theglobalphotographer.com. Yep. And then uh, you're also the global photographer on Instagram. He's a great Instagram to follow if you want to get your daily dose of great wildlife <laughs> photos. And then you're at Andy Biggs on Twitter. Yeah, so really straightforward. Um, and then on Google Plus, I'm just oh, I'm Andy Biggs <laughs> Photo Safari is technically on here, but you can still just search for my name and find me. All right. Well, thank yeah. you so much for joining. This was a genuine pleasure, and I don't want to take you. up too much more of your Friday. But I'm going to say I'm I'm going to start saving my pennies now for a Coleman's Clop Clip trip. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's good that you're booked out for a trip next year. <laughs> oh, you said it was. Yeah, yeah. We'll see. We'll see what I can do. <laughs> you said you're booked out for a while, so that's good for my savings account. So. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so again, thank you for doing this. And when you come back, you know, in a couple months, when you come back from your next trip, we hope you can, you know, share some of those images with us. And we'd lo I'd love to see more. And again, cool. thank you so much. And uh, thanks, Jeff. Thank you. I'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. <laughs> bye. <laughs>